Hello everyone, how are you today? I hope you're having a really good day. If you're new to my channel, my name's Taylor. I come to you from Baltimore, Maryland, and on my YouTube channel here, I feature content that is focused on knitting and spinning. However, in today's video, I wanted to touch on some recommendations and suggestions for those of you out there who are interested in either starting or continuing a yoga practice, especially if you're struggling with something like sciatica or low back pain. Uh, this video was recommended by a good friend of mine, Jackie. Actually, she just helped me for recommendations. I decided to put it in a video um, when I saw a private message from Donna on Ravelry who reached out to me and asked me what I could suggest for her to get started in this new year in beginning a uh, yoga practice. I know a lot of us knitters uh, live somewhat sedentary lifestyles. I know that I certainly do. And yoga has been an incredible support for me in helping to, uh, one, regulate my emotions because learning new things is generally hard. <laughs> Um, also keeping my hips and spine supple and healthy as well as strong and I would say probably innumerable other things that we could always get into at another time but I wanted to share with you all some helpful information in starting a safe and healthy yoga practice especially especially if you deal with sciatica or back pain so if you're interested in that do please keep watching if you haven't already Please subscribe to my channel. I upload weekly. I have a great podcast episode uh, for you next week. I'm going to upload that next week. It's just taking me extra time to edit, but I um, I hope that you're well and you're hanging in there uh, in 2021. And we'll just get started. Let me stop for a second and just tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I have been teaching yoga consistently week by week for the last seven years. I have both the 200 and the 300 hour trainings under my belt. So I have 500 hours of uh, Hatha yoga training. Hatha yoga is this giant umbrella term for all types of physical asana instruction, vinyasa, restorative, beginner, intermediate, advanced, hot, not hot, all of those things are Hatha yoga. So that's typically what every certified instructor's training is in. Um, I really love to teach one-on-one -on -one sessions with students and I prefer to offer classes for beginners because I like to really nail down the foundations and the kind of energetic actions of what to engage, what to relax, and how all those things fold together. So that's my background. I also live with psoriatic arthritis and spondyloarthropathy. Um, so I deal with low back pain that is specific to my SI joints. If you're not familiar with the SI joint, it's the space between the sacrum and the ilium. And those two bones have this joint called the sacroiliatic joint. So the kind of joint that holds your hip bone to your spine is where I experience inflammation and erosion and this kind of regrowth of the bone that fuses them together, creates a lot of pain and discomfort. So um, with that, I struggle with a lot of the same things many other people do who have many different issues. If you're familiar with sciatica, it is uh, nerve pain originating from the sciatic nerve, which runs um, along that area near the piriformis muscle. So in about half the population, that nerve literally runs through the piriformis. Um, sometimes it's alongside it. And if you deal with instability of that SI joint like I do, you could develop kind of a chronic tightening or kind of this um, spasming of the piriformis muscle, which is working really hard to hold stability in that area and it can affect that nerve. So um, if you're like me and you have an autoimmune condition where there's inflammation of the joint causing joint pain and then a muscular reaction causing a muscle spasm and pain, uh, which can then result sometimes often with nerve pain. So uh, I've learned how to distinguish those types of pain and I've used my yoga practice to help me do that. Um, if you ever have any questions, feel free to reach out to me directly. You can find me on Ravelry, Instagram, Twitter, here on YouTube. You can leave a comment below or you can email me at threadtomend at gmail.com and I'm happy to answer any specific questions you might have about any of these topics in this video. Um, but I wanted to share a few things about getting started with your own practice. 
Number one recommendation is to begin an Ashtanga yoga practice. Now, Ashtanga yoga is one of the older vinyasa lineages. If you were to think of the yoga that we know in studios, the asana practice of yoga, it is kind of one of the grandfathers of vinyasa style, meaning that a lot of the yoga we practice in studios is derived from um, and it, I almost any vinyasa style yoga is derived from Ashtanga yoga. If you were to Google Ashtanga yoga, you're gonna see some crazy, crazy things like really intense and challenging advanced level practice. Now, one thing to know about that is that a lot of people, most people spend their entire lives learning to practice the very first series of postures called the primary series. And I don't want you to get a uh, discouraged in thinking that the primary series is unattainable for you personally. It's unattainable for most people. And a lot of people that practice Ashtanga practice at home without a teacher because there's no one around. It is a self-led practice. It's one that you learn to memorize and sequence your breath with your movement. That's what vinyasa generally is, is sequencing your breath with movement. So it's a challenging practice. It's one that develops strength, endurance, and flexibility. Um, and it is one that I trust because it's sort of tried and true. And the sequencing of postures, I believe, and, and I think many others uh, would attest, is very intelligent. So Ashtanga yoga is where it's at in my mind. It's what I practice at home. It's a solid framework for a uh, physical practice of yoga. However, I strongly recommend any of you out there new to yoga, learn to modify your practice. And if you're working with a teacher, that's the best way to do it. I know that not everywhere, especially right now through our current pandemic, uh, a lot of people are not able to practice in studio or practice one-on-one -on -one with an instructor. Uh, private sessions are often financially unattainable. Um, I know a lot of teachers who generally travel around the nation or even internationally. They're probably not traveling right now to offer their regular annual workshops and things. But when the world kind of gets back on track with that stuff, if it ever does, um, I'm sure that that might be something to look forward to if you're interested. So I mentioned Ashtanga Yoga is where it's at. Now, how do you modify a Ashtanga Yoga practice? Um, I'm going to go through a few notes. If you have a piece of paper and a pen, you might want to write these down to reference later because it might not make sense to you as I'm saying it. So how I modify my practice, and I will tell you that on my very worst day, when I'm experiencing the most pain and discomfort, usually my pain is in the very early morning hours and then the last few hours before bed. So um, dealing with an autoimmune and inflammatory condition, my pain kind of goes away with movement and action uh, versus something more like osteoarthritis, which kind of starts to hurt with the more wear and tear you experience throughout the day. So when I wake up, I am stiff, I am tired, I am sore, I don't wanna practice. Yet, I know that if I do, I will feel so much better having done it. And so I will sleepily lay out my mat and modify my practice uh, with the following sequence. So my worst day, worst day ever. I think any beginner out there can probably start here. So I'm sharing it with you all. I'll practice only one Surya Namaskar or Sun Salutation A. That's where you inhale the arms up, exhale, fold forward, inhale to half lift and lengthen your spine, and then step back to a plank position where you lower through the posture called Chaturanga. It's like a push-up. You'll inhale into an upward facing dog or you'll modify that up dog to take a more gentle position like, um, what do we call that one? Baby Cobra. <laughs> and then you'll exhale to down dog. And then from down dog, you'll step back forward, inhale to half lift, exhale to fold, and inhale to rise up and stand. That can be a lot for me and my back in the morning. Um, in a traditional Ashtanga sequence, you practice that five times with one breath per movement. I, again, I modify my practice and take as many breaths as I need to to move carefully and safely. I'm just gonna interrupt my sequence really quick to say, when you're folding forward, bend your knees, 
Keep your feet, knees, hips in two parallel lines so that there's this energetic action where you're connecting your muscle and strength of your hips with action in the legs all the way down to the feet. So you're rooting down into the feet. You're building this neurological connection throughout the body, this engagement and this breath that's kind of synced. You're um, inhaling to extend, exhaling to fold with the knees bent. And when you fold, I want you to think about sending your butt way back behind you and hinging from the hips, folding your belly towards your thighs. So hinging at the hips, like you have this crease of the hips that's folding like a piece of paper and you're bringing your belly towards your thighs with your knees bent and your butt way back behind you. Okay, that's super important, especially if you have issues with your lumbar spine, like your L4, L5, or sometimes people struggle with the S1, L, whatever. Um, so I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a doctor. Please know that this is not medical advice. I'm just telling you what my experience is and what I've seen in a lot of students. So just make sure that you keep your knees bent, you stick your butt back, and you hinge from the hips when you fold, whether that's standing, seated, or otherwise. Bend your knees. Once I practice one to five Surya Namaskar A, I will do at least one, if not five, Siri Namaskar B, it's a similar sequence, but you are incorporating a warrior one position. Warrior one is an amazing posture for helping you to develop strength and flexibility in both the front and the backs of the hips. Now, the hips are really complex. I don't think that I can get through all of the complexity in this short intro, um, but I want you to know something that I've learned from a really incredible teacher out there. His name is David Kyle. He um, has taught a few workshops in our community. And one thing that he pointed out to us that I thought was brilliant, and I never really thought of it that way before, is that all of us have our unique bodies and we might inherently have long, ligaments or muscles um, or short ligaments and muscles. Our connective tissue can be kind of short or long. There's kind of two different types of people in the world, right? You have the really limber and flexible, that's me. We struggle with stability and strength. And then you have other people who have a shorter kind of ligament or cartilage type of tissue and they might be very firm, very stable, but struggle with flexibility. So you can have inherent qualities that are short or long. In addition to that, you can also develop strength and flexibility, and those are separate from the long, the length of your ligaments. So with warrior one, as an example, um, with the back leg, you're cultivating strength in the glutes and the deep rotators, um, while also lengthening and increasing flexibility to the front of the hip and the hip flexors, especially that psoas muscle. So you want to obviously practice any posture on both sides evenly. It's important to count your breaths so that you know that there's an applied measure to each side and you're not just guessing how long you might have been hanging out there. If you do find that one side is very different than the other, we all have asymmetry, then you're going to maybe consider holding that other side a breath or two longer. It's okay to do that, especially if you feel like it helps to bring a little bit of balance to both sides. Now, the primary series of Ashtanga starts with five Surya A, five Surya B. There's a lot of videos on the internet on how to practice those short sequences of postures. I'll do a little research and link to some videos below on how to practice Surya Namaskar A and Surya Namaskar B. Um, and then you move into the standing sequence of postures. A lot of people who are brand new to Ashtanga yoga will start with the opening sequence, as I've mentioned, move into standing, and then maybe if they feel up to it, they might repeat that just to increase their memory, um, recall the sequence of postures more easily, and then ultimately memorize the sequence of postures without having to reference um, materials. So. The standing sequence is challenging. It is helpful to, to practice with an instructor who can give you feedback on what to engage and what to kind of correct. Um, highly recommend seeking out someone who can offer more detail in practicing each of those postures. And 
then once you get to the seated sequence, you're probably cooked. You're probably done and that's okay. You can just do a forward fold. Again, bend your knees, bend your knees, fold from that front hip crease, stick your butt back, keep your chest nice and lifted, engage your belly, use the strength of your belly in your forward folds. Please don't just forget the work in the upper body when you're folding forward from a seat. Um, seated forward folds are kind of more dangerous than other forward folds. Seated forward folds are one of the few postures that people very often injure themselves, especially slip discs and things like that. So when you're folding forward in a seated position, make sure you extend your spine nice and long, you're lifting your chest, you're drawing your shoulders down and away from your ears, and then you're using the strength of your belly to send your belly to your thighs with your knees nice and bent, okay? That's gonna help you cultivate this holistic strength that connects the whole body, the upper half, the lower half, and you're gonna feel like it's easier. I mean, so much easier. It's a lot more work, but you're actually doing something that benefits you versus potentially slipping a disc back behind you because you're so intent on, you know, getting your chin to your shin. If your spine's rounded, your chin's never gonna touch your shin. You gotta think of first hinging from the hips, lifting the heart, and sending the heart forward to reach your knees, okay? So try not to round your spine too much in your forward folds. After that, I typically modify my practice with going straight into back bends and then finishing up all that I can in the closing sequence. The closing sequence is also challenging in Ashtanga yoga. I don't want you to get discouraged in the entire sequence of Ashtanga and think that, well, I can't do a headstand, I can't do Ashtanga yoga. I can't do a shoulder stand, I can't do Ashtanga yoga. You can modify your practice and there's so many ways to modify. Bridge pose is a really good posture to supplement instead of or prior to wheel position. Not many students can do wheel. I taught beginner classes for weeks and weeks and weeks. I had some students that came to my class consistently and never got to practice wheel pose. And it could be a structural element to their unique design um, where that's just not possible and that's okay. You don't have to do it the way someone else does. You just have to learn what your body needs so that you're offering it everything you can for ultimate function and health. I hope that that's helpful. Um, I'm gonna synopsize that again. So one to five, Sri Namaskar. A, one to five, Sri Namaskar. B, the standing sequence, as much as you can, do a little forward fold, a little back bend, and then whatever you're able to accomplish in the closing sequence, give it a shot. I hope that's helpful to you. There's a few books I'd love to recommend if you're interested in reading more on the subject of yoga. I know that not everyone is a book person. I'm personally not, but I have a few in my library since I've been teaching for so long, and I'd love to share those with you. The first is by Michelle Cassandra Johnson. It is called Skill in Action. As you can see, it is quite small. It's a really good read. I have not yet even gotten my way through this one because I find myself stopping and you know cornering pages to share with students. If you're looking for a book to really, really read on the full subject of yoga, I highly recommend BKS Iyengar's Light on Life. It will take you through a lot of the principles of yoga philosophy and study. It is a pretty all-encompassing book for any new student. Um, it doesn't dive as much into the postures, which I really like. It kind of, you know, gives you a lot to think about. So highly recommend this book. If you're a yoga teacher and you don't own this book, what are you doing? I have a few other books that are introduced in 200 hour trainings and things like that. Um, I have read them, they're valuable. I don't know that everyone needs to. Um, and I just wanted to give one more recommendation. This is not a book that was ever introduced in any of my trainings and I haven't read it, but I wanted to share it in case you are an anatomy geek and you wanna understand who, what, when, where, why. <laughs> this book, Functional Anatomy of Yoga, again, David Kyle, amazing teacher. Um, this is a guide for practitioners and teachers. He is an Ashtanga yoga teacher, so a lot of this will be relevant to the practice. 
However, I think it's really applicable to any yoga practice and it's a lot like a, a textbook. You're gonna really get into the nitty gritty on what to engage, how, and the way postures work. It also, I mean, it just has a lot of really good information. I should probably read this cover to cover one day, but I'm not a reader. I just, you know, I like to think that I know everything. I don't. Um, Anyway, I can't recommend this book enough. It does have a lot of great information. I hope some of that information is helpful to you. If I didn't touch on everything I could and you still have questions, again, please reach out to me. Um, yoga is a really amazing physical practice to help people develop strength, endurance, flexibility, kind of a calming of the mind. Um, ultimately, this practice is to help us achieve a certain level of control of ourselves so that our actions, our words, our thoughts even are steeped in this level of compassion that we're able to extend to ourselves at our deepest levels, as well as all of those in the world who sometimes challenge our capacity for empathy, and compassion. So um, I hope that this video might inspire you to start a practice if you haven't already. And I want to thank you so much for watching. If you haven't yet already found me on social media, my name is Taylor E. Owen on Ravelry, Instagram, and Twitter. And once again, if you haven't already subscribed, please consider subscribing to my channel. If you enjoy this video, please remember to give it a like. And I hope that I'll see you in the next one. Take care.